So hi everybody, my name is Volker Simonis. I'm working for a small company called SAP. We are doing virtual machines, Java virtual machines, uh, a commercial one called SAP JVM. We are doing uh, uh, the PowerPC AAX and S390 ports in the OpenJDK, which I'm leading. Um, since recently we are also doing a binary distribution of the OpenJDK called Submachine. You can grab some stickers after the talk if you want. Uh, now let's concentrate on class data sharing in the hotspot VM. So my, the other uh, speakers have laid a good foundation uh, for, the, for this topic. And I will concentrate on uh, how class data sharing is actually working in the hotspot VM, how the new application class data, share, class data sharing, which will come with Java 10, will work, and um, shed some details about, how, about the implementation and the current restrictions. So my slides, they are all on GitHub. Uh, so if you, oh, no, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can look at them later if you want. So class data sharing, it's supposed uh, to cache pre-processed class metadata on disk to improve startup performance and reduce memory footprint. We've heard that several times today. So short history of class data sharing in the hotspot VM. It was introduced uh, since quite some time in JDK 1.5 in 2004 already, but at that time it was quite restricted, so it only supported the client VM and serial GC, and it could only be used for caching system classes. Um, it was done, uh, at that time it was in the Sun JDK, it was done in the initial contribution for OpenJDK 6 and 7. Then sometime nothing happened uh, on this topic, since, uh, but in, in JDK 9, there were several improvements. Uh, support for the server VM was added for G1s, uh, parallel and parallel old GCs. Uh, also support for shared strings, so not only classes, but also strings could be shared. And uh, with uh, Java 9, uh, applic uh, support for application class data sharing was added, but uh, in JDK 9, it's only in the commercial Oracle JDK as commercial feature. Coming with J Open JDK 10, with JEP 310, application class, class data sharing has also been also been added to the OpenJDK. So this is uh, actually a short overview of the of Andrew's talk, just for for people who didn't saw this. So we have on the right side a Java class, and um, for every Java class, the hotspot has to maintain a certain kind of of uh, metadata which is stored in the meta space. Previously, this was the permanent generation. Since Java 8 is in the meta space. And this is, these are all C++ objects. So there's an instance class, and the instance class links back to the class object, which represents the type of the, of the foo uh, object. And then we have the class loader data, which also links to the class loader in the Java heap. And we have a class loader data graph, which links together all the class loader data, so actually all the class loaders, so, we can, so the VM has a chance to iterate over all the classes which it has loaded so far. We have the constant pool, which was mentioned before, the constant pool cache, which is used to speed up uh, mainly the interpreter operation by caching a resolved uh, object, the constant pool. And uh, finally, we have the method data, the constant method data, which contains the bytecode and other things which aren't supposed to change. And finally, then we have the end methods, so the compiled methods, which reside in the code cache, which is, again, a different area of the heap and which we won't touch in this talk. Okay, so how does CDS work? Uh, so before we can start to use class data sharing in the hotspot VM, we first have to create uh, the shared archive. So this is an offline step, and uh, this is also one of the problems of the class data sharing implementation in hotspot we will see I will talk about this at the end of my talk when it comes to the limitations. So by just calling Java minus X share dump, uh, there will happen a lot of stuff. And I'll briefly go through these steps. So first, uh, the VM allocates uh, space. You see the address. That's actually the address where the shared archive will be mapped into memory. So every instance of the hotspot will map the shared archive at the same memory address. You can configure this with a command line option if you're not uh, happy with this address, but generally it, it's uh, 32 gigabyte. It will be mapped at uh, 32 gigabyte. Then it will loading the classes to share, and uh, 
you may be surprised, but uh, your, your, your JDK or JRE, if you download it, it already contains a class list, which is a, a, a plain text file with a list of classes. This uh, is generated at build time. So when you uh, build the JDK, as it was shown in one of the previous talks, there is a, a small Java application which tries to mimic uh, other small Java application. It, it includes uh, some of the containers, uh, some of the util classes, and so on, and generates, and from this the j class list is generated, which is part of the JDK. And when you run share dump on your host, this class will be used to load, preload all these classes and create this uh, shared archive. Then a lot of stuff is done on the preloaded classes, like class verification, for example. So this has to be repeated later on when the shared archive is mapped into your uh, space, in, into your uh, Java process. You see the number of classes. So there is about 1,200 classes in this class list file. Um, some unshareable information is removed. For example, uh, if you remember the, the image I showed you before, there are links to the class loader, for example, in the meta space. And obviously, these are uh, different in every VM instance, so this cannot be shared in the shared archive. So such information is removed. Uh, pointers which uh, point from one class to another are relocated. Uh, then, as I told you, with Java 9, we can also store some string objects and symbol tables in the shared archive as well. These are also dumped into the shared archive. And finally, the links to the Java mirror class, which is actually the pointer back into the Java heap, is also removed because every time the shared archive will be mapped into a Java process space, this link has to be updated because it's obviously different in every, every running instance. And then finally, the whole... Um, archive is dumped into a file, and you see the, the archive contains read-write and read-only spaces. Because obviously some of the part is really constant, but some part, like for example the instance class, has a pointer to the, to the class object, to the, to the Java mirror, and this has to be uh, patched for every running instance. So like every shared library, also the uh, libc library, for example, contains constant parts and read-write parts which can be uh, patched, and this, this, will, uh, this will bind these pages which are changed by the process to your Java process. So they actually aren't shared uh, once more than one Java process is using this archive. In the end, you see uh, the parts which uh, are mapped into the heap. So you see this is another address, um, and uh, this is why this only works with G1GC, because G1GC has the the possibility to uh, to map some parts into um, its memory region, which contains the saved strings. And in the end, you see we generate uh, this shared archive, which again is stored by default in, in your JDK directory under lib server in the file class is JSR, Java Shared Archive. Um, again, you can change this name, uh, this location. We will see that later on in, uh, in the other examples. And the size is about 18 megabytes of the shared archive. So just a trivial Hello World, uh, Hello CDS uh, sample Java program. We just print out Hello CDS, and then we read in a read line so we can analyze the process once it's running so it doesn't stop. Uh, now, how do we use uh, CDS? We just uh, put uh, x uh, minus x share dot uh, an on option onto the command line and run our program and nothing special happened. So how can we verify that now our classes really have been loaded from the shared archive? Well, we can misuse uh, the new logging API and uh, uh, instruct it to give us uh, a log of the class loading. And when we run it this way, we get a line for every class which is loaded and uh, Every of these lines contains a reference um, to the location from where the class was, has been loaded. And if this class has been loaded from the shared archive, you see a source uh, shared object file. For example, uh, not all files have been loaded from there. So for example, the Java internal, I don't know, I've abbreviated it, URL class pass file loader was obviously not in the initial class list, so it is not 
has not been uh, dumped to the shared archive file, so this is loaded from the module, from the base module, right from the file system. Finally, also, uh, my uh, example application has been loaded from the file system because it was not, uh, obviously not in the, in the shared archive, in the class list. Um, we can just uh, check how many classes um, have been loaded from the shared archive. And if we grab for shared object files, we see that 477 classes are, have been loaded from the shared archive. And if we do the opposite, so grab for all the classes which have not been loaded from the shared archive, we see it's just about five. So for a toy application like Hello World, which uh, your estimation was right, it's about 500 classes. Uh, we see that most of them uh, get loaded from the, from the shared archive, so that's fine. So performance, uh, Christian told, me, told us that we shouldn't use time for performance measurement, but this is not really a, a serious performance benchmark, so I just used time uh, to do some, some measure, measurements. So we see that uh, when we run uh, with uh, shared archive turned on, we get about 9% overall performance improvement for the whole application. And if we measure the time until uh, our application class gets loaded, which is usually the last class for a Hello World program, we see that it's about 13% faster. So I will show some numbers later for Tomcat, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't reproduce this 20 or 30%, uh, which uh, Michael mentioned for their benchmarks. I'm not sure if I did something wrong, but I think, uh, yeah, in my measurement, it was uh, not more than 10 to 13% improvement. So uh, let's see uh, how much memory we can share. Again, uh, we run uh, uh, the Hello CDS program in background, uh, and then we use the PMAP tool. So Chris, uh, Christine uh, introduced the PMAP tool. I think it's really a great tool and probably the, the only tool which gives you uh, the real uh, true information about memory usage because it's the uh, right information from the kernel. So it has uh, a lot of options. You could use X, even XX to get a lot of more information. I just uh, pull out some of the information which I think is interesting for us. So if I run PMAP on our Hello CDS proce uh, process, uh, you, you see the, the binary, the Java binary, which is mapped into memory. Uh, you see here the Java heap. So by default on my machine, Java heap has about two gigabytes. But from these two gigabytes, uh, there is just about 129 megabytes are really mapped. So it's read-write. The other part of the heap, it's uh, reserved, but, but not mapped. So it's actually uh, the difference between uh, the RSS and, and the virtual space, which you see in top or in PS, which often confuse people. Uh, and then finally, you see the, our shared class file. Um, uh, which gets mapped to, to several locations. So the, the, the first two lines with FF, that's the, the part which is used, uh, which contains the shared, shared strings and which is uh, mapped into the Java heap by, by G1 GC. Uh, and then again, you see the different parts, the read-write parts, uh, which, which can be potentially uh, patched by the, by the instance which loads the shared archive file. And you see the, the constant file which is truly shared. So this, this will always be shared between all the instances while the read-write part may be at some point in time uh, privately uh, mapped to your own uh, instance of Java and, and you, you will not have sharing. So for example, the, the, the bytecodes, that's a good example. People think bytecodes, they are constant, so they can be always be shared. But for example, what do you do when you do debugging? Well, you patch the bytecodes, so you cannot really put them into uh, read-only memory. They are in the read-write section, and most of the time they are shared. But when you start debugging your application and patch your bytecode, you will just uh, make this uh, page. It's a copy and write. You just make this page private for your process, and only all the other processes which don't touch uh, this page will, uh, will share the memory. OK, so uh, this was a toy application just to show you how everything basically works. So now I've tried uh, to use uh, CDS and the new AppCDS, which comes uh, with Java 10, with Tomcat and NGrinder. It's some kind of application. I really don't even don't know what, what it really does. It was just a, a big war file which I wanted to deploy in order to get a lot of classes loaded so I can do some measurements. 
So Catalina options, it's actually an uh, environment variable which uh, influences uh, the way how Tomcat starts. And um, we can now uh, launch uh, Tomcat uh, with um, uh, class data sharing on. It will use the, the shared archive which, you've in, which you have just created in the first step inside our JDK directory. And uh, we also uh, use xlog uh, to, um, to log all the loaded classes into a file uh, just to, to get a baseline of how many classes have been loaded. So when we run word count on that, we see that uh, Tomcat with this ngrinder application loads about 12,000 classes. And uh, when we now grab for the number of classes which uh, are loaded from the shared uh, archive, uh, we will see that it's just about 1,100. So it's, if you remember the shared archive, which we've in, uh, the default shared archive, which we've, which we've created initially, created about, uh, uh, contained about uh, 1,200 classes. So mostly, most of them have been used by Tomcat, but Tomcat, again, uses a lot more classes. So uh, how can we improve the situation? Well, uh, there is a command line option called dump loaded class list. When we run Tomcat with that, uh, the, the VM itself will print out a list of all the classes it has loaded and it uh, thinks it can share in a shared archive. So it, let's just use that and dump that in a file. And when we look at that file, we see that, again, that's just about 3,000 classes from the 12,000 classes. So why is it so? Because CDS only allows, uh, by default, sharing of, of system classes which get loaded by the, by the boot class loader. Uh, so obviously, that's about 3,200, but all the other applications classes cannot be sh uh, shared by the classic class data sharing. So here enters the scene application CDS, which promised to allow class data sharing also for application classes and even for custom class loaders. So again, we, we start Tomcat and add the use app CDS option. So you can do this, you can try this yourself with the early access uh, OpenJDK 10 builds. And uh, when we look at, uh, at the results, that's actually pretty disappointing. So we see that uh, there's about 300 more classes can be shared now, but uh, that, that, that's actually not a lot. So what's the problem here? So dump loaded class list still only dumps the classes loaded by the boot class loader and the platform class loader and the application class loader, also known as system class loader. So obviously Tomcat itself is a dynamic application and it loads not really many classes through the application class loader from the class pass, but it loads a lot of classes with own custom class loaders. And unfortunately the dump uh, loaded class list option doesn't handle these classes. So what can we do here? Uh, well, let's first use the file that was generated with the 3,500 classes and see how we can regenerate uh, a shared archive with these classes at least. So we use the xshare dump uh, option uh, like at the first slide and we turn on application class data sharing and now we can tell uh, the Java VM uh, the, the location of a class list so this time we don't take the default class list which comes with your JDK, but the one we have just created. Um, and then we can also tell the, uh, the, 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 the JDK the location where to write the created uh, shared archive to. So we don't want to store this archive into the, right into the JDK directory, just to uh, a second place, uh, another place. And for some unknown reason, this is a diagnostic VM option. I, after the first time I will file a bug to, to, to change this because I don't see why a shared class list file, it's, it's a normal product option and shared archive file is a diagnostic option which has to be unlocked first. Anyway, that's how it's today. And uh, when we look at uh, the created uh, shared archive, we see it's much bigger now. So if you remember, the first shared archive which was created from the default class list was about 18 megabytes in size and, and this one is now nearly 50 megabytes in in size. It obviously contains more than 3,000 classes, while the first one only contained about 1,200. Um, and now we can use this shared archive again uh, 
by turning uh, class data sharing on using AppCDS and uh, giving the VM uh, the location of the shared archive so we don't want to use the default uh, shared archive but the one you've just uh, generated. Okay, but uh, actually AppCDS, as I told you, uh, promised uh, to support class data sharing uh, of classes, uh, not only of the classes loaded by the, by the application class loader, but also for classes loaded by custom class loaders. So how can we, can we reach this? Unfortunately, we saw that the dump loaded class list doesn't help here. So, uh, so we have to, to sorry, I'm just... Uh, one moment, somehow my slides. Get out of order. Sorry. So yeah, how, how can we create uh, this from the, by, by scratch, a class list to, uh, to enable application class data sharing um, also for custom class loaders. So when we look at this uh, class list, it's actually a trivial file of classes. And uh, it, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, there is no co documentation for how we can uh, use application class data sharing for, for, for custom classes. We have to look in the hotspot code to the class list parser CPP file, and there we see that uh, this class list file cannot only contain class names, but it can also contain another format like class names with an ID and uh, with, uh, yes, with, uh, with references to the superclasses and the implemented interfaces and the source of uh, these classes. And when we look at the output of the, X, uh, of the class list load with, with the debug option, we see that uh, actually this uh, output contains exactly this information. So it not only tells us the loaded classes, but also the, the class loader which loaded the classes and the, the source files where they, were, where they were loaded from. And from this uh, log output, we can actually as assemble uh, easily a class list file which contains the, the required information. And I've wrote a small tool called CL for CDS class, class list for class data sharing, which is on GitHub. You can easily Google for it. There is not many programs with, the, with this name. And uh, when we uh, now, uh, we can now run uh, uh, Tomcat uh, with the logging class load in, in debug mode and dump that to a file. We can then just call the CL for CDS tool to create a class list uh, from uh, the, 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 the class loading log. And, uh, and then we can uh, use that list to create a new shared archive. And when we do that, we see that now the archive is about 100 megabytes big. And uh, when we run a Tomcat with this shared archive uh, and, and count for the classes uh, which uh, are truly shared, we see that it's about uh, no, this is the, the whole number of classes. And when you call for the, for the shared classes, we see that it's about 9,000 now. So that's, that, that, that's better. It's still not optimal, but it's better. And what's the problem? Well, AppCDS still has some limitations. So for example, it doesn't support one dot, uh, Java 1.5 classes. And obviously, uh, this NetGrinder and Grinder application still contains some old classes. Also, dynamically generated classes can be shared because they are generated dynamically at runtime. Uh, different classes, uh, a class which is uh, loaded several times by different class loaders can only be shared uh, one time for one class loader. That's another limitation. And also classes uh, which get modified by the class loader itself, not by an instrumentation agent. But there are class loaders, for example, NetBeans has such things. That's why it's not easy to use AppCDS with NetBeans, which has class loaders which load a class and then do some bytecode uh, changes to the class and then feeds it to the VM. Obviously, that cannot be done uh, with the CDS implementation in Hotspot because the dumping of the shared RFAG is, is an offline step which has no idea how the class loaders modify the classes. Another problem is that bytecode rewriting is switched off for the reasons I've told you before, so in interpreter speed might, might be slower. So that's actually it. 
Here's another link to the slides, and you have any questions, please come to me. I will be here the whole day. Thanks a lot.